Well, hello, Rally friends, and welcome back to my kitchen table. Now, uh, those of you who are perhaps a little more on the ball than I am will realise that I'd asked for questions for this kitchen table uh, quite a number of weeks ago, probably two weeks ago now. Um, do you know what? It's absolutely typical, isn't it? Uh, you get a little bit of time off, and I've not had a lot of time off this year. Uh, three weeks, four weeks off, which has been really, really, really appreciated, particularly as it coincided with the summer holidays for the kids. Uh, and you get ill. It's awful. I don't know. They talk about racehorses. Apparently, when racehorses retire, it's almost guaranteed that as soon as they stop training, they get sick. I see myself as a finely tuned racehorse. The minute I stop working, I get ill. It was most unfortunate, and I do apologise that it's taken me a little while to get back. But, uh, but there we are, feeling uh, probably 95% better now. So we're almost there, which is really important. Um, so what do we want to talk about? Well, there's been lots, hasn't there? Really an awful lot going on in the past few weeks. Yes, we've had this big summer break, but there's been plenty to keep us, well, I was going to say excited, maybe not quite excited, but to keep us... Uh, talking, to keep us interested, to keep the momentum going, if you like, for this season. Uh, obviously, there is the championship situation, and I want to talk a little bit about that, and who's in the box seat. I think that's pretty obvious. The other thing I want to talk about is the continuing rumour that perhaps Adrian Formo is considering a move to Hyundai for next year. That rumour fueled by the comments from Mr. Abitable about you know, the experiment of having three third drivers this year, maybe not working. I would agree with him on that one. Uh, a lot of discussion about whether maybe Formo is high on die bound. I'll discuss the pros and cons of that. The other thing I want to talk about is Martin Sesks. Uh, he's got another opportunity, hasn't he? Coming up at the, where are we going to? Chile, at Rally Chile in a few weeks time. Uh, that'll be really, really interesting. I want to discuss that, and I also want to discuss, uh, really, if you like, the battle of the young guns. Sesks with his debut, and then Sammy Pyre with his debut in Finland. Who came out on top? Is it fair to actually be judging these young drivers at this point? I'm not sure it is, but we'll try and, try and look into that a little bit and see uh, if we can decipher anything from those two, both incredibly impressive debuts in full Rally 1 cars. I am still treating, I suppose, Latvia as Sesk's debut because the Rally 1 minus car, which he drove in Poland, and he will drive in a few weeks' time in Chile. It's not quite, it's not quite the full beans, is it? In fact, it's a long way short of the full beans. So, for me, it was very much Latvia as Sesk's debut, and it was very much Finland as Young Pyre's debut. We'll discuss that. But I think we'll start, shall we, uh, with the championship situation. Thierry Neuville from Sebastian Ogier, from Oik Tanak, and then lagging a little bit behind Elvin Evans. Uh, you always asked, you know, is, what is the situation with Neuville? Has he got one hand on the championship trophy already? Well, I think he has. He's got one hand, and I think he's got four fingers up the other hand on the trophy. Now, there'll be those of you jumping up and down saying, don't be silly, it's rallying. He's barely one rally ahead, 28 points, I think 27, 28 points, his lead over Sebastian Ogier. And you're right, you know, if he has a disaster in Greece, which is always possible, Greece is such an attritious rally, uh, you need a little bit of luck and an awful lot of know-how, knowledge, experience to get through rally Greece without any problems. You know, Greece is one that anything could happen in. And yeah, you know, if he does have an, a, a zero somewhere, then potentially the battle is right back on again. But he's more intelligent and clever than that. More, more clever, more switched on, more attuned to what's needed than that. I don't see that happening. I think Neuville now realises that this one is his. This is his best opportunity. And let's face it, he's been trying to win the title for the past 10 years. And he's had some really good opportunities. He's thrown them away in the past. This is a very, very strong position he finds himself in. And it's a bit disappointing that his nearest challenger is Sebastian Ogier. What Ogier knows is that it will take a specific set of circumstances for him to win the title this year. And I don't, I genuinely don't believe that is Ogier's motivation. Ogier, I think, is doing this for the team. I think 
you know, if you read the article on Dirtfish this week that uh, quotes, uh, who is it, Christian Loyal, talking about the situation with uh, Toyota bringing back potentially Sebastian Ogier to do the remaining four rounds, and Loyal says it's an act and a sign of desperation. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know whether that's the case or not, but I do believe that Ogier's motivation in coming back is to assist Toyota in winning uh, more likely the manufacturer's championship than the driver's. But he's a realist, Sebastian Ogier, and he knows that Thierry Neuville very much has the upper hand here. Why does Neuville have the upper hand? Well, clearly because he's got those points in the bag. He has that lead. But you look at the calendar, you look at the remaining four rounds, and it suits Neuville. You know, Neuville's got the difficult, difficult Acropolis rally to negotiate. He can be conservative. He can afford a more uh, cautious approach in Greece. We then go on to Chile, fast gravel rally. You don't make any mistakes there, you should be okay. And then what happens? We go to two tarmac rallies at the end of the year, and that is the critical situation when you try to evaluate the various options here in terms of the championship. It's those two tarmac rounds. If Nouvelle can hold on to his lead and it, you know, he can lose more or less all of it. As long as it's a lead going into CER, my money would still be on Thierry Nouvelle. You go to two tarmac rallies, first on the road, absolutely the place to be, particularly as we saw last year in CER, it got very, very messy indeed. Yes, it's a little earlier this year, but it's still potentially going to be one of the messiest tarmac rallies that we'll come across. And what does that mean? It means you want to be first on the road. It just gets messy, polluted, difficult. It all comes down to Neville more or less having this one to manage. If he can manage his way through the next two, as I say, Acropolis is the really difficult one. But if he can manage his way through the next two events, it is Neuville's to lose. Now, we are talking rallying, and we've seen drama in the past. We've seen people throwing it away at the very last minute. I sincerely hope that we go to the final round in Japan with two, maybe three drivers still in with a chance of winning the championship. And that is possible. It really is possible. For that to happen, and for any of our chasing three to overhaul Neuville in the latter part of the season, it's going to take one of those three, either Ogier, Tanak, or Evans, to, I believe, win at least three out of the four remaining rallies. Why do I say that? I say that because of this iniquitous situation with the points. It, it is nonsense. And again, take a, a look at the article on dirtfish.com that Luke Barry wrote about the points situation. It is an absolute farce. It is a farce, and I've said it from the start, and I will continue to say it until they change it. It is just so unfair and ridiculous, quite ridiculous, that a Sunday with 30, 40 kilometres can be worth 12 points. It is nonsense. There is no fairness in the Sunday driving in that you know, those that have done well, those that have stayed on the road on Friday and Saturday, are punished effectively. They can't push flat out on the Sunday. They have to go with a more cautious approach. If there's the potential for punctures, they can't take a risk and say, well, actually, I'm going to go with one spare tyre. They've got to take the two. What does that mean? It means they're in disadvantage, clearly, for the Sunday run. It is wrong on so many levels, and it needs to be changed. And there are some very, very good solutions out there for changing it. And, you know, I don't know. I, I've, I've given a few of my solutions, and uh, I'll, I'll quite happily give a few more, but maybe maybe that's for another, another kitchen table. Um, but... What it does mean, as I say, is that Nouvelle can play the canny game. And what he's shown this year is he's very, very, very good at playing the canny game. If things don't go his way Friday, Saturday, he is very capable of rescuing something from difficult weekends. That will work in his favour with four events to go. And that is why I believe that one of our three chasing pack will have to win rallies. And they'll have to win three rallies and they'll have to perform on the Sunday as well. That is no easy task. Who's capable of doing that? No question, Ogier. And for me, Ogier is the biggest threat now to Thierry Neuville. And Ogier, just by his presence, being there at the final four rounds, is a threat. He has still a bearing around the service park. There's an almost intimidatory factor 
about Ogier. When Ogier is there, you never know. You can never, ever count on winning while Ogier is still in the mix. And I, I do believe that he's still very much the, uh, the certainly the biggest threat to Thierry Neuville heading into this last four rounds of the season. Um, I'm just, I'm just, I'm working out in my head. I'm arguing with myself as I'm talking about because I, I think Ogier has to be. He has to be. He's got a bit of momentum quite clearly. He's driving beautifully. He is getting better and better. There is no question. When he loses a touch of top speed, a touch of commitment, and I mean a touch, a touch, a touch, a touch, a tiny touch, he makes up for that in his ability to manage situations and his ability to uh, make the right decisions. Making the right decisions is all about uh, them becoming a champion. Great champions invariably are the ones that are able to make the right decisions at the right times. Those that have come close, you know, they make the right decisions a lot of the time, but unfortunately they make the wrong decisions at times where it then becomes catastrophic. Ogier always, nearly always makes the right decision when it comes to risk, when it comes to tyre choice, when it comes to strategy. He nearly always makes the right decision. Uh, and that will be critical going forward into this battle. The other one I'm, I'm debating and I'm, I'm arguing in my own brain as I'm talking here is clearly Oik Tanak. Tanak for me is a man that is capable of winning the final four rallies, never mind three out of the four. But we just don't know where he's at. He has had two enormous crashes in the past three rallies. It was massive, the crash in Finland, uh, the crash in... Uh, Estonia the week before was just as big. Both still slightly unexplained as well. Uh, odd accidents, both of them odd. Now, there's two elements to this. One is the mental side of it. You know, how quickly can he get back and, and you know, commit himself fully, which is what he will have to do if he wants to win the title. He will have to be fully committed. He cannot afford to take his time, to spend a rally or two getting back into it. He needs to be back on it First thing, as soon as we get to Greece, bang! Tanak has to make the most of his road position and be right there. Uh, is he capable of doing that? I think he is. I think he's got the mental strength to deal with that. The other element is the physical side of it. Physically, how fit is he? Well, he's been testing this week in Greece. Um, not sure who the co-driver was on the test, though. Not sure. Not sure who the co-driver. There were pictures from a helicopter uh, that showed a, another Estonian co-driver. Um, so is there a question mark over perhaps Martin Yarvoa's uh, fitness going into Greece? Um, you know, that would be a real blow. That would be a real blow. If you had to change co-drivers in this critical point in the season, uh, you know, I'm not hearing anything. I'm not, not hearing anything particular. Uh, so, but we'll have to wait and see. It would be an absolute blow. It really would, you know. Uh, it doesn't matter the calibre of the co-driver you bring in. Just that change can sometimes be enough to upset a driver, to just not allow them that 100% focus, that 100% commitment they need to win amongst the drivers that we're talking about, with the level of performance that we're seeing from Ogier, from Neuville, to a lesser degree from Evans, I guess. So, you know, there are question marks over Tanak. Tanak himself is capable of doing anything, absolutely anything. But the circumstances around where Oik Tanak's at right now uh, are what really is, is fueling this debate that I'm having in my own head about whether he's capable of winning it. I, I would still say that Oji is the man that is most capable of taking the fight to Neuville, but Tanak is equally capable. What about our fourth contender? A little bit farther behind, 36, 37 points, I think it's 35, 36 points behind. You know, it's a rally and a bit for Elvin Evans. Elvin has no choice now. Elvin has absolutely no choice. He absolutely needs to go for it. You know, there can't be any conservative strategy. If he wants to be world champion this year, he needs to go for it. He needs to go for it. He needs to win in Greece. He needs to potentially go to Chile and win there, where again, road position will be an advantage. Uh, and then we know that Evans is enormously capable on the tarmac. He would give himself a chance. But we need to see something very, very special, in particular in the coming two events from Elvin Evans, if he is to feature as one of our contenders when we go to Japan in two or so months' time. Uh, has he got it in him? For sure he's got it in him. He really does. 
There is a question mark over the whole strategy, though, with Toyota going forward into these last few rounds. You know, they're desperate to win something this year. They really are. It would be a disaster. It would be nothing short of a disaster if Toyota were to walk away from this season without either a driver's or a manufacturer's championship. Um, you know, if they're looking at the manufacturers, Evans's role becomes a different role. It really does. It really does. And, and you know, does his role become more of a team playing role in that he's there to score those manufacturer points or is he still given free reign? You know, Toyota talk all about there's no strategy or there's strategy. There's no team orders. There's clearly strategy. There's always strategy involved in rallying. But there's no team orders. Hmm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure they can stick with that going into the latter part of the season. I think, I think if they are to make a challenge for the drivers, it has to be with Ogier spearheading it. If there's to be a challenge for the manufacturers, sadly, it probably has to be with Elvin Evans supporting Ogier in terms of that all-round approach to winning the Manufacturers' Championship. Evans is the one I would worry about in terms of the man who could potentially drop out of that fight for the championship title this year. And make no mistake, if he comes away from the Acropolis with a mediocre performance, a mediocre result, a mediocre points haul, it is more or less all over with three rounds to go. So huge pressure on Elvin Evans if he is to stay in that fight for the driver's title. I think he's capable of doing it, but again, there are unanswered questions. There's all sorts of factors that we we're not fully informed about right now with Evans. Much, much as we're uncertain about Tanak, we're a little uncertain perhaps about Evans and what his approach, what his job may be going into the last four rounds of the season. The one that we know, there are two that we know exactly what they're going to do. One is Neuville at the front. Two is the chasing Sebastian Ogier. Goodness me. Goodness me. Listen, even if we just go to Japan with Ogier and Neuville in the fight, oh, what a prospect that is. What a prospect. Oh, getting ahead of ourselves. But it's still very much on for both championships this year. Now, uh, the one team we haven't talked about in all of that is M Sport. M Sport have done a, a great job this year. A great job in keeping that car there or thereabouts. It's not a long way off. It really isn't. You know, four podiums for Adrian Formo this year. Stage wins. You know, it's a good-looking car. Sesk's making his debut in that car, winning stages. Yeah, not a lot wrong with that car. There really isn't. And we understand there are more upgrades to come. Uh, the rumours, the rumours, and the rumours are fueled from various uh, camps, or from various sides. The rumours are, uh, are there and are real, I think, and are, are rumours that are justifiable. Uh, the the rumour of for more going to Hyundai next year. Um, it's a strange one for me. It's a really strange one. Yes, I get what Abitabo is saying, and I think he is correct. I really do think he's correct. You know, Andrew Adamo flagged this. Uh, you, before we saw this new generation of hybrid world rally car, he said, no. Nah. He said, you're not going to really benefit from part-time drivers. These cars need drivers who get plenty of seat time, get to know the cars, get to know how to get the best out of the cars. You can't have them jumping in and out of the cars every few months uh, and having to, uh, you know, each time they get in the car, spend time catching up. He said that, and it looks as if maybe a bit of both realised that. It's a funny old season this year. Three drivers sharing that third car. Um, has it been a success? Mm, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Your Lappe has looked good at times. Mickelson's looked good at times. He's looked poor at other times. Your Sordo has done what Sordo does. So a bit of both has said, hasn't he? Next year we're going for a full-time driver. What are his options? Who are his options? Okay, Lappe has said no. He ain't doing a full-time season. Not yet anyway. And that's a shame. That's a real shame. But, but Lappe is doing it for all the right reasons. You know, he understands uh, that in life, family comes first. And he understands that a full-time season is a long way from what his family needs right now. And I, and I, I take my hat off to that man for putting putting his family before his professional ambitions. Uh, there aren't many top-line sportsmen who have done that in the past. Uh, and, and well played, Esapeka Lappi. You, you'll always get credit from here um, for that decision. So he's taken himself out 
of that discussion if a bit of ball decides to go with one driver next year. So the other one, Danny Sordo. Again, Danny Sordo took himself out of that equation four or five years ago. He stated he didn't want to do a full-time season. The part-time season suits him. It suits his lifestyle, suits where he's at, uh, and it suits his abilities right now. You know, he does come into the gravel rallies with that advantage of road position. Um, and and he, he performs. He performs as Danny Sordo knows we can. He, know, we, he performs as we know he can. You know, he's right there or thereabouts. He's, he's the most reliable, dependable driver. Is he going to win your rallies going forward? Maybe not. Although over the years, I suppose Sardinia has shown us that he can win in the right circumstances. But he's probably not going to win your rallies. But that's not what you want from a third driver, particularly not a third driver in a tight title battle. You want someone that you can rely on to deliver those points. He is your safety net below your two battling, you know, championship protagonists at the top. I'm taking Sordo out of that equation. I don't think Sordo would consider doing a full season. Andreas Mickelson. Well, yeah. Yeah, for me, Mickelson is maybe not a bad shout for a full season with High and I. He's a man that knows where he's at in his career, you know, knows he's not going to be world champion, knows that he will have to play the game uh, and might appreciate the, the efforts or might appreciate uh, the responsibility of being a full-time third driver at High and I. I think Mickelson is a reasonably strong candidate for that job. But, but, the one we keep hearing about, apologies, one o'clock, that's good, only chimed once. For some reason I thought it was 12 o'clock, lost an hour. Um, the one we keep talking about and hearing about is Formo. Ah, you know, yes, the right decision. Formo is fantastic just now. Formo is putting himself in position to be picked up by uh, you know, existing teams by new teams coming into the championship going forward. He really is showing all the right credentials, not just on the stages, but off the stages. He presents himself beautifully. He is what rallying is all about. He's got a really young, dynamic, creative approach to how he sells himself. On top of that, he's a fabulous driver who is now capable of winning rallies while he's with M Sport. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that the Hyundai move would be the right move for Formo. Hi, Formo is probably the right driver for Hyundai. That I think is correct. But is Hyundai the right move for Formo? In my view, he needs to think about it very, very carefully. He needs to have a look back at how third drivers have coped in the past in Hyundai. You know, you look at Hesapeka Lappi. Lappi knows his position. But, you know, he's had to give up positions, he's had to give up podiums, he's had to, to drop time to the other two drivers. You know, potentially, Adrian Formo is going into a team next year with two world champions. With Tanak and with Neuville, potentially. Where does that leave him? It leaves him as absolutely the number three driver. The number three driver is there to support the other two. You know, he's not going to win rallies in a Hyundai. I might do, he might do, but only if the other two drop out. He's got a better chance of winning rallies, I believe, and I firmly believe this, in the M Sport car. Continue the development for M Sport, look at the commitment, and then make your mind up. For me, you're going potentially from number one driver at M Sport to number three driver behind two very strong characters, and we know the influence that Nouvelle has got in that team. And that influence, I think, continues to grow, continues to grow. He is very much, right now, the number one driver in that team. You know, Tanak is a particular character. You know, is he a team player? Not sure. But all the greatest champions have a degree of selfishness, a real degree of selfishness to make themselves champions. He's a world champion. Nouvelle is a world champion in waiting and a very dominant character. Your number three driver there, a driver that wants to prove themselves, a driver that wants to progress his career, a driver that wants to compete against his two number one drivers or one and two driver in the team, nah, that's not a good dynamic. That is not a good 
dynamic. And if I was formal, and if Adrian came and asked my opinion, I would tell him quite publicly, stick with M Sport. Stick with M Sport. Stick with M Sport and, you know, uh, M Sport, who knows where M Sport is going? Who knows? You know, Malcolm Wilson is a genius. He's a genius. He's kept that team going for so, so many years. It is very possible that with the new 2027 regulations that Ford might actually start to see a little bit of value in rallying. And they may well increase their investment into M Sport and their commitment to rallying. And then you've got a powerhouse of a team. A powerhouse of a team. Do you want to leave that for uncertainty? And there is uncertainty over the commitment that Hyundai have beyond maybe even 2025. We don't even know that 26 is committed to yet. I don't know. It's a difficult, and I get this, I get it. I get it's a difficult situation. But, uh, you know, if there is a decision to be made for Formo, it is going to be one of the biggest decisions of his life. And it is a difficult situation. And, uh, you know, and he will, there's no question, look at all the variables, he'll wear it up, and you'll make an informed decision on which way to go. Um, my advice, stick with M Sport. Stick with M Sport. My advice to Hyundai, get a third driver who is not there to compete against your number one and number two driver. For me, that has to be Mickelson. There are other options, but for me, Mickelson, Mickelson would do that job of securing those manufacturer points for you going forward. It's a debate that will go on for a little while longer. I don't know how long we're going to have to wait to hear some resolution to this one. Perhaps not that long, we'll have to see. Now, the third thing I wanted to talk about in this kitchen table was Sesks against Pyre. Um, do you know what, Sesks, Sesks and getting this opportunity again in Chile, does that tie in a little bit to the uncertainty about Formal? Maybe, maybe. You know, we know how clever Malcolm is at identifying talent, at developing talent, and sometimes they're moving on talent and recouping his investment by moving that talent on. I, you know, if Formo were to go to Hyundai, it does, and this is the other reason I don't want Formo to go, the balance in the championship just becomes really precarious, really precarious. Right now, you've got M Sport that have got Formo there with the potential to win. He's an exciting, young, dynamic driver. Take him away and give him to one of the two powerhouses, and it does leave M Sport in a difficult situation. And is that why we're seeing Sesk getting this second opportunity? Maybe, maybe. But, you know, I hate to think of the situation. M Sport going to another year next year. This year they've progressed, they moved forward for podiums. It's, it's, it's looked close to a winning car. You know, next year they want to be moving on from that to actually winning rallies. If Formal goes, difficult. If Sesk some, comes in, it gives them again a similar driver, but you restart that process, that learning process, that developing process, that young driver process, and it's not ideal. It's not ideal. But Sesk has that ability. He really does. And we saw it in both the events, in Poland and then more pertinently in Latvia. An, an enormously impressive debut. Compared to Pires, different situations, really different situations. Pyre had an awful lot more seat time in the Rally 1 car before his debut in Finland. Yes, he was up against drivers who knew a rally, uh, you know, knew the rally um, as well as he did. You know, the top drivers know, know Finland almost as well as someone like Pyre does. So there was no advantage there, particularly. Yes, it was uh, you know, a rally that he'd clearly done a lot of testing for, he'd done a lot of relevant testing for. Um, and he scored that incredible stage win. He drove using his head at times, which I was really impressed by. You know, I would say that if I needed and I was forced to say who made the more impressive debut, fractionally, I would go with Sesk. And that is weighing up all the different variables. The fact that it was Sesk's home rally, the fact that all our top drivers were there for the first time, he had that road position advantage, um, as did Pyre in Finland. But... Uh, you know, I think the fact that Sesk kept that battle for that podium alive right down to the final stage for me was enormous. It was quite enormous. It showed a mental ability to cope with pressure, a mental ability to cope with the demands of that car, the demands of the World Rally Championship. And that, almost more than anything, is what makes him stand out and stands him in really good stead going forward. 
really good stead. You know, the fact that we know he's got the ability. There are lots of young drivers who have got the ability to actually drive cars quickly. Lots. You know, not all of them are able to make that step up to rally one. We've seen that a few times in the past. Um, but more importantly, it is the ability mentally to deal with the demands of the world's greatest motorsport and you're know, operating at the very highest level in that sport. He's got it. He absolutely has got it. And I'm really excited to see how he gets on in Chile. Once again, in the Rally 1 minus car without the hybrid. Um, but, you know, he can still do a job there. And I, I expect him to be in the top five there. Uh, we'll see if he can continue through that event without making a mistake. His first two rallies, a small mistake, I think, in Poland, but not an awful big one. Um, you know, nothing in effectively, no mistakes in Latvia. If he can continue that through Chile, it will be quite some performance. It really will. Pyre, I'm excited about, you know. I uh, have to say, you know, he wasn't, wasn't the one that absolutely set the timesheets on fire in the last previous two years in Rally 2, but he shows an intelligence. And he's clearly shown something to Yari Mati Latvala, who's very much taken him under his wing. And, and, and I think the future of Finnish rallying is safe in Pyre's hands. Um, he has the potential to win rallies as well. No question about that after that performance. It shows that he can deal with those cars at those speeds. Um, he, needs, he needs a lot more work. As to assess quite clearly, more than that, he needs a lot more seat time. Seat time is the most important thing. Um, Pyre has the advantage of being effectively signed up already by Toyota. So he, you know, that takes a bit of the pressure off him going forward. Cesc has to keep things going. He has to keep the momentum. He has to keep his hand in, and that means next year um, doing, I, I imagine, at least five or six rounds in a Rally 1 car if he can find a way of making that happen. And, and that may come about because of other circumstances that we've already discussed. Who, who knows? Let's, let's wait and see. So, uh, yeah, if I did have to say who edged it in terms of the two youngsters, Sesks, for me, fractionally, fractionally edged it. But it's just incredibly exciting to see two young drivers who are quite clearly capable of fast times in those cars, which we know are so, so difficult to drive. We know the gap between the Rally 2 car and the Rally 1 car is enormous. Uh, and, and those two drivers have shown that they can deal with that. And that, for me, is really, really exciting going forward. And so there we are, folks. Really very, very much now. Looking forward to getting back out uh, to Acropolis next week. Sometimes I forget where I'm going. I really do. It's a busy old time. I go from Acropolis, by the way, out to one of my favourite events, the Daybreaker Rally. Folks, if you haven't, do me a favour. Um, as well as liking this little video and sharing it and doing whatever else you do, it'd be very nice if you did that for me, uh, go and have a look at the Daybreaker Facebook page and uh, give them a little follow. It's a wonderful event, 192 kilometers, uh, one day event in the Rangatiki and Manawatu region on the North Island of New Zealand. I'm really looking forward to getting back out there for that straight after the Acropolis Rally. Daybreaker Rally, one word, Daybreaker. Look it up on Facebook, give them a follow, folks. Um, yep, so off to that one, and then, yeah, I think we're off to Chile, and then back to Australia for another great rally, and then back to Europe for one or two events. It's a busy time coming up, a really busy time, and I can't wait, really can't wait to get back out onto the stages. Folks, as always, once you've liked, once you've followed, shared, whatever, um, leave some comments in the comments below. What do you think? What do you think? Sesks against uh, young Pyre? Hmm. Who's it going to be that's going to win the driver's title this year? Is it going to be Thierry Neville's year? Quite possibly. Can Ogier catch him? Will Tanak bounce back? Has everyone's got it in him to uh, mount a challenge in the last four events? Let me know in the comments and I will engage with you there a little later on. Folks, thank you very much for joining me once again at the kitchen table.